Hello everybody, I'm Dominic West. I play Jimmy McNulty. Um, isn't it astonishing how little we've all aged over the years? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm truly, truly sorry not to be uh, not to be there at this great reunion. We've been talking about a reunion for uh, so long and uh, it's never happened. So thank you to Paley Fest New York for, for organising this and thank you all for coming and supporting. Um, I'm really, really sorry I, I'm, I can't be there. Um, because some some of the panel owe me money, and uh, Seth, you owe me a, um, a flight to Los Angeles. And uh, David, I, I wish we could catch up. It's been too long, and um, I hear you're casting your new show, but uh, that's uh, good luck with that. Hope that process hasn't been concluded yet. Um, I uh, I gave David such a hard time when we were when we were making the show uh, because I was homesick and, and missed my daughter back in London and um, he was constantly good about it the fact that I kept asking for time off but he did say eventually um, with slight exasperation you know in about 10 years time Dominic you're going to be uh, you're going to be sitting in a bar somewhere and you're going to be saying to anyone who listen um, you know I I used to be in a TV show called The Wire and um, the the person you're talking to will will look at you sympathetically and put his arm around you and say, uh, you know, sir, I, I, I think you've had enough to drink. Don't you think it might be time to go home? And David, you're right. This happens to me on a weekly basis. Um, and on a daily basis, uh, I still get people coming up to me in the street telling me how much they love the show. And... Uh, a lot of them say that they have come to it for the first time, which is uh, astonishing when you think how long ago it was that we, we, we made the, the show. <laughs> um, but I think it speaks of it, the longevity of great, great writing and great performances. And also, they come from all walks of life, uh, the fans of The Wire. Um, they have one thing in common, which is that they're, they're nice and intelligent and... and um, in great contrast to fans of other stuff I've done, perhaps. But uh, that breadth of vision that David and Ed and all the writers had is borne out in, in, in how popular the show is and how many people it appeals to. So uh, love to all of you there. I miss you. And um, I hope you all have a wonderful night celebrating what I agree with many people say is the greatest TV show ever made. See you next time. Alan Sepinwall is the TV critic for HitFix and the author of this critically acclaimed book, The Revolution Was Televised. So please welcome Alan to the stage. So we are very fortunate to be gathered here to uh, be celebrating a reunion of, as Dominic said, perhaps the greatest show in the history of television. I've been in the green room, I've been in the bowels of the Paley Center with this cast. A lot of them have not seen each other basically since the show ended. They're in very high spirits. We're very looking forward to having them out. Are they? Okay, we're good to go. All right, we've got a big panel. We will start with, he played Bill Rawls, John Doman. as D'Angelo Barksdale, Lawrence Gilliard, Jr. <laughs> as Sergeant Ellis Carver, Seth Gilliam. <laughs> as Mr. Presbo, Roland Presbolewski, Jim True Frost. As Marlo Stanfield, Jamie Hector. <laughs> I, 
I have to say this at least once in my life, Omar Kamen, Michael Kenneth Williams. <laughs> As Detective Kima Gregg, Sonia Sohn. Yeah. As the bunk, Wendell Pierce. Producer Nina Noble. And finally, for our last panelist on the stage, co creator and executive producer David Simon. I should say this is not a very big stage, so we actually have some additional special guests in the audience right here in the front row Michael Lee, Tristan Wilds. Third row, Bob Wisdom is Bunny Colvin. JD. 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 Oh, JD. I didn't see JD. Bobby. Bobby. Okay. Bobby. Oh, it's Bunny Bunny. Yeah. JD. JD was not in his assigned seat. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm curious. When the show was originally on, how often in a given day or week did you guys wind up being recognized for being a part of it? Zero. <laughs> <laughs> and how often now do you guys get recognized for being on the show? Like always. Every yeah. day. <laughs> Every day. Five times a day. Every day. So, so what's it like to have worked on this show in, in relative obscurity at the time that has now become snowballed into this thing that is so beloved and talked about in the terms that Dominic used in the video and so many other people have, and, and be approached all the time about this work you did quite a while ago now? It's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, it's great. It's, and it's, and it's, it's, I think, especially gratifying that it keeps going, just like Dominic was saying. It's like... You get people all the time who are just saying they've just discovered it, and for that to keep happening is just like a, a, a blessing you could never even imagine. It's very strange when you're in the middle of the Grand Bazaar in Istanbul, <laughs> and somebody grabs you talking in another language, but you can understand the wire, the wire. <laughs> Bizarre. I mean, for me, too, I think um, the most pleasant thing I take away was, was having the experience of working with such beautiful people. I mean, I, that's something that I guess, I wonder if anybody could ever really know is how close we were as a family and how much we supported each other and just um, the level of, of, of performance that we, we shared with each other. Man, I, I just, that's the best thing I walk away with was the, just being grateful for having been exposed to such a, an awesome uh, a cast, cast members. I mean, I, I, I have this mantra that it's always about the work that you do and the people that you meet. And the relationships that you build. Because I, I use that all the time, Wendell. <laughs> and, and the relationships See? that you build. <laughs> and all the time. Because that's the thing that's going to last forever, uh, whether there's a response like we have now or not. And um, we j just now, just a few minutes ago, standing in the control room and watching the clips and then looking around <laughs> the control room and seeing uh, you know, all these actors that I have such admiration for and realize that we were this really wonderful family. And because we didn't get recognition while we were on the air, we partied a lot. So <laughs> right. we had a good time. <laughs> I, I wish you guys could have seen it in the elevator on the way down here. The entire cast does sing along of Way Down in the Hole. It was <laughs> fabulous. Um, David and Nina, I'm curious why you think the show has not only endured, but sort of built up in esteem and sort of awareness in the year since it was on. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but when we started, there was 
there was a sense that there was nobody really watching, but we knew that we were doing work that was important and work that was, that was special that we were proud of every day, I think. And as the guys have said, it was an incredible family. There was, a, there was camaraderie that still um, continues to this day, you know, that, that people su are supporting each other still. I think that's what, what kind of made it special. Um, but we were not a hit, and um, when, when The Wire first started, it was, we still had VHS tapes. So I think that was probably part of it. it. It was difficult for people to watch, to follow the show from one week to the next, and once, once they were able to binge watch on weekends, we became more popular, I think. What show are we talking about? <laughs> <laughs> The Wire, I think. Um, I agree with Nina. It, 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 we had, there was so little expectation um, and so little, uh, uh, I, I, mean, I remember our numbers came in, some of our early numbers, and Carolyn Strauss, one of the firmest supporters of the show at <laughs> HBO, uh, I, I expressed some dismay about how few people had watched us on a given Sunday night, and I remember, I'll never forget her quote, it was, oh, it's a cute little number. That's what she said. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't worry about the numbers. And, and, and it was like that. That was a window at HBO at a given moment. Of, um, it was a very rare and improbable window in the entertainment industry. And, and I'm very grateful for it. Uh, for the actors, I'm curious. I mean, a few of you had been on Oz, Michael. I know you guest starred on The Sopranos. But for most of you, this was a relatively new kind of show you were coming to. What were your expectations for it, and, and was there a moment at which you realized, wait a minute, I'm, I'm part of something special here? Well, well, for me, I was, you know, this was the first uh, reoccurring character. You know, I'd never had this much responsibility as an actor before The Wire. And um, I remember, um, you know, I was really psyched that um, I was huge fans of Wendell Pearson from his past work and Sonia Song, her work on Slam. and. So when I heard and went and, um, and Wood Harris, all I knew was those three names, and I was going to be working with these three guys. I was I was hooked, and then I went down to Baltimore and I fell in love with the city. And um, you know, then the whole uh, season, first season, you know, I came on as a reoccurring character, and 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 the character, you know, started to grow. And so I fell in love with the cast, I fell in love with the writing, I fell in love with the city. So what do you do? You move to Baltimore. So um, I. I I was waiting for second season, like, okay, where's this, where's this storyline going? And then, you know, <laughs> I got introduced to the mind of David Simon, and he took it to the docks. And um, I, got, <laughs> I got real bitter. I was, I was very angry. I was the angry black man. You know? And um, I approached David, you know, in my ignorance. And I was like, you know, how come when we made the show hot, now you want to give it to the white people? Like, this is our show. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And he looked Michael, at me. Michael, Michael, that's, that's the way it works. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know where you've been the last 50 seconds. <laughs> that's how we do. But that wasn't the answer. That's how we do. His answer was, he said, he, he, he looked at me with, with like this, um, this patience in his eyes. And he said, um, trust me, if we went back to, the, if we go back to the projects, right back to that storyline, he said, we're going to make the city and this story we were trying to build here look very small. And that went way over my fucking head. <laughs> <laughs> way over, you know. <laughs> but it wasn't until um, it wasn't until season three that things started to click. You know, as we started going out into the into the public and people, I started seeing how people were reacting to the show and, mm -hmm. and to the character, and to, yeah. and to all the storylines. And, and season three, it hit me. I was like, oh wait, this is not about me. <laughs> it's not about me, it's not about my career. It's, it has no, and, and I felt, I felt instead of being um, arrogant and, and, and ignorant, I became very humble and grateful to be a small part of this huge picture. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that stayed with me throughout the rest of the season of The Wire. Yeah. At, at first, it was a uh, <laughs> shock. You know, David always said to us, this is a novel. It's, it is a visual novel, and just like novels, you, you're building the characters, you're building the world, you know, so just be patient. All the pieces matter and all the pieces mm. fit. I, yeah. and I, I, I just want to add, you know, Michael's saying it, it's not about me. I want to say, having grown up in Baltimore, living 10 years in Baltimore, a part of it was about me, you know. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> and so I, I, you know, when I remember getting the script, my agent called knowing that I'd grown up in Baltimore. He's like, you won't believe they're doing, HBO's doing this thing, you won't believe where it's happening in Baltimore. And so I get it and I read it and I literally know the streets. <laughs> like, I know the people. And I remember feeling just like, I've got to get this. If I don't get anything else, I got to get this one. Because this, uh, you know, it's like, they're talking to me. He's talking about me. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, and so when I did, I was fortunate, blessed enough to get the part. And I went and did it. And I want, I want David to know that I've been spoiled ever since. Because the writing was just so incredible. When I read it, I knew, because you asked if we knew it was something special. I knew from the first page that it was something special. And I knew that I had to up my game <laughs> because of how special it was. I really feel bad that we killed you the second season. <laughs> if you're going to be, if you're gonna be that sorry, gracious, I got to go down here. Really David. <laughs> to this little hug. <laughs> I, I, my heart just <laughs> fell to the floor. How beautiful. Um, because we all were in our own little worlds, you know, at this time. A lot of us were just really beginning our careers. This was the first steady gig that we, we had, you know. Me too. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we, there was a lot of, we did a lot of growing together. We did, did a lot of discovery together. We learned a lot about the business together. We learned, we learned when we were important, when we weren't. Um, and I'd like to just sort of tag, uh, tag on to what, what uh, Larry was saying. You know, only I think Michael and uh, Andre, and maybe you knew how much this story was resonating, you know, my own life. And, and in a way, it was about me, but I, w I, but I wasn't even clear at the time. You know, I came into the show just like everybody else. We were like, I was like, hey, paycheck, because I hadn't had a job in two years. <laughs> and, uh, and Andre was one of the few, he was the only person that I really knew um, coming into the show. And, uh, and I, re I remember, we, we, we saw the pilot. We, we, the, the pilot was shot. Day. Were you there? Yes. So, so Andre and Andre was like, yeah, we can go in a conference room. We can see the pilot. I was like, okay, so. Me, Andre so, Royo, and Sonia right. saw like this. I was oh, you were there, too? I was there that day, too. Were you there when we fell on the deck? So we're looking at the pilot. <laughs> we're like, okay. Because okay. I, I didn't get it. It ended. And we're like, oh, Lord, oh. save your money. This ain't going nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. God. He went, oh, my God. He went, oh, my God, this is going <laughs> I gotta get it. I gotta get it. <laughs> We're like, oh, I got it. But Wendell, though, Wendell, you said no, no, no. See, Wendell, to me, you, you Larry, I didn't know you knew that this was something special because oh. a lot of us were like, oh, I don't know, it's kind of slow. <laughs> 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 but Wendell was one of, Wendell, I, you were one of the first people within the first three episodes, I think, that were like, no, 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 guys. And you, you know, Wendell became kind of like your voice to the actors, uh, David, explaining to us that it was this problem <laughs> and that there was an impact to it. That was just hope. <laughs> I was just. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Absolutely. In the meantime, I was calling my agent, like, listen, call listen, law and call. order. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be free in about two weeks. <laughs> well, following up on that, Wendell, you talked before about David's idea that this is a visual novel. And, and often, the thing I hear from people is I really needed to get to episode four, episode five, before I could actually understand what was happening, who all these people were. You guys had the scripts, but did any of you have the same problem, just sort of keeping track of the story early on, or was it was it easy for you? I had to watch the show with subtitles for like the first, <laughs> for like the first seven episodes. And I don't know what scripts you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> we usually saw the script the day we were shooting. Okay. It. <laughs> it wasn't that bad. No. <laughs> Two days before. Bad. It was two. about two days before. And you know, Maybe. fortunate for me when I came on in um, season three. I got a chance to see most of the story before that, so I jumped on board immediately. The part that resonated with me was when um, Michael B. Jordan's character was murdered. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, yeah. you know, my manager, Ali, she saw it and she looked at it and she said, she just called me and said, you see this show on TV? It's amazing. I mean, it's honest to what's going on out here. And as soon as I turned it on and saw it, I, it, it was a go. And then when they called, when we went into the room and I, re I met with David and um, Nina, and they said we got the part, it was just a, um, it was a moment for, I guess for me, just the same way that everybody else felt because it was my first series regular. 
Now, there's a famous scene in the show that, that Wendell's in, in in the fourth episode where basically only one word is said and <laughs> many variations of it over and over. Um, how long did it take you guys to get used to both the level and the creativity of the profanity in the show? <laughs> <laughs> Fucking easy. <laughs> No, David, David came to us uh, one night we were shooting. He said, I'm writing this scene. This is what's going to happen. You're going to go over it and all. He said, you know, we're going to get a lot of uh, pushback on the language that we use, so we might as well just go for it. We're going to do this <laughs> entire scene, but the only word you're going to say is fuck. And we went, well, OK. Um, and uh, it was great to work on. Uh, my one disappointment in that scene is the actual super had the last line in the original script. It was all written out, too, yeah, he did. That, which was great. Uh, it was a great acting exercise. It's one of the scenes I'm proudest of. But we look for it, we find it, we find the casing. You know, oh, fuck, fuck, oh, motherfuck, fuckity fuck, all of that. <laughs> then we look at it, and then at the end, when I find the casing, the super goes, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that didn't last, but I, we had a great time doing it. <laughs> John, you're, you're introduced, um, you know, memorably flipping McNulty, the, the double bird, and... Double bird. <laughs> Rawls was particularly creative in his use of the language. How did you try to approach that as an actor? Well, I, you know, I, I heard a lot of that language growing up as a kid around, you know, the, the uh, fish town section of Philadelphia, which is not that far from Baltimore. But it was a pretty salty area. So, I, you know, I, I could pick up the rhythm fairly. <laughs> and, and, and he was a Marine. So, you know, they've been known to occasionally, Marines, yeah. <laughs> utter a curse word or two. Just, you know, now and yeah. then. Now, the, the other notable language, obviously, is the jargon that both the cops and the crooks use. Were any of you particularly either adept at it, or did any of you really struggle with just sort of mastering the lingo and, and getting it out and understanding what it was supposed to be? I, I, I was... I mean, I knew it, so it was easy for me. What was amazing to me was that it was on the page because you don't read, you know, it, it was all on the page. So I didn't read a lot of scripts where I'm like, I talk like that. <laughs> <laughs> <You know? laughs> That's exactly what I'd say. It was just awesome. In all honesty, for, some, for the most part, I thought it was a mistake. <laughs> Right, Tristan? Look, <laughs> I read it. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, hold on, they said this wrong. This is not said correctly. <laughs> you know, and then um, as we went through it, and then I heard, you know, Micah was actually working on the character also, his Baltimore accent, and it was not yeah. two, it was two. T. I spoke T. to David. David said, it's not it's Baltimore, Jen, it's Baltimore. Baltimore. Say, some, of you, some of New Yorkers say dog. Say dog. 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 <laughs> dog. <laughs> That was, um, um, that was oh. definitely uh, 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 something that was very animate about that um, David gave me the, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the ability to choose whether I wanted him to sound like a Baltimorean or a dude from Brooklyn. Mm. And I chose the Baltimore dialect. And um, if you really listen, season one and two, I, I struggle. I come in and out. I would say it, it, it was in the pocket for me by season three. I, I felt like I really understood the language because I was I was living in Baltimore. I spent a lot of time with with the with the people in the city, and it just kind of you know resonated in me. And I, I feel by season three it was in the pocket for me. Now Jamie mentioned before Michael B. Jordan Wallace's death is one of the big moments in the first season, and then that leads to a moment we got to see in the clip reel before. Where's Wallace, uh, Lawrence? What was it? What was it like on the set that day doing that scene? Mm. The Where's Wallace? Yeah. <clears throat> It was uh, just a tense day, you know. Uh, you could feel it in the air, you know. I could, anyway. And, and uh, another part of me, just as an actor, you know, I wanted to get it right. You know, I was, uh, it was a powerful, powerful moment, and I wanted to get it right. I wanted to get it right for the fans. I wanted to get it right for David. I wanted to get it right for Michael. Um, and, yeah, there was... Uh, I'd probably say I was just scared, <laughs> you know? I was scared all day, like, I can't fuck this up, <laughs> you know? Um, but the director was really cool. He would come over, you know, I remember he would come over and he, he wouldn't say much. He'd come over and he'd go, <laughs> he'd do one of those. And I'd go, okay. And then I'd do it and then he'd come back and he'd go, 
And I go, all right. Mm. <laughs> Who's, who, who directed that? Is that Ernest um, Dickinson? What's his name? Uh, Ernest Dickinson. No, Ernest didn't do that. That was a um, Canadian brother. Oh, Cle oh Cle 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 uh, Clement. Clement, oh. yes, yes, uh -huh. yes. No, David, so the show gets a lot of power over, over the years with the repetition of language, sometimes like at the beginning of the season and in the end. In that scene, it's just, it's the one line being said over and over and over again. Why did you decide? I didn't decide. We wrote it like a couple of times in the script. It's repeated a couple of times, but the explosion from Larry was, uh, you know, Idris and Larry, they found that together. And when it happened, it wasn't, you know, there was no implication of it on the page. But once it happened, it was just like, of course. That's, it was, mm. yeah, I can't take credit for that at all. Now, speaking of Idris, I believe we have a surprise message from Mr. Elba, if uh, <laughs> you can put that up on the screen. <laughs> Isn't he James Bond yet? Hello, Painty Fest 2014. <laughs> the Wire. <laughs> Big shout out to my Wire team. How are you doing, guys? Uh, I wish I could have been there today, unfortunately, I can't. I'm somewhere very exotic, as you can tell from my background. <laughs> I was actually asked to say a lot and, you know, do a speech, but like Stringer Bell, I don't like phones, so I'm going to keep this short and sweet. I just want to say thank you for uh, the Paley Fest for throwing this together. This group of people in here um, are amazing. And, uh, and we are privileged to be in the same room, except I'm not in the room. But anyway, uh, David Simon, you're a, a genius. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to build Stringer Bell. What a character. Uh, that character defined a certain point in my career and continues to do that. Every, every meeting I take, someone references that character. Thank you so much for taking the time to come here today, audience. Um, the Wire team love you as you love The Wire and um, well I'm going to say goodbye because um, I think the feds are coming. <laughs> love. <laughs> <laughs> David, I know a lot of the characters on the show, including Avon, had real-life inspirations. Was there a real-life stringer, or was it entirely an invention? Uh, he was based on a character uh, who was sort of a number two to, to Melvin Williams, uh, in a case that Ed Burns did, uh, named uh, Chin Farmer, Lamont Farmer. Okay. It means nothing to anybody, but if you're from Baltimore, you'll... <laughs> Still not really get the reference, <laughs> which is a tribute to the character. If you think about it, it's like you know he was the kind of guy who could have a whole career and and not many people would know about him. Now Michael referenced earlier, sort of you come back in season two and everything is upended. You know McNulty's on the boat. We're now focusing on Sabatka and the dock workers. A lot of the characters who were very prominent in season one are, are in the background. D'Angelo's in jail. Were any of the rest of you sort of concerned, like? What, what's going on here? What's happening to my character? Or do you learn to roll with it by that point? Right. Seth, you got to go. <laughs> <laughs> Seth, Seth and Dominic, <laughs> Dominic Lombardozzi, you got to tell the story, Seth. I, I leave it to you. Yeah, we, we were shooting a lot of second unit with, uh, <laughs> with Robert Colesbury, um, who I think was, was, was trying to keep us um, entertained after a while. We were taking like lots of shots of spider webs and <laughs> you know slow walking track. It's like, there, is there even film in that camera? <laughs> you know, what the fuck are we doing here? It's like George Steinbrenner. I'm gonna find these fantastic guys who always beat the Yankees. I'm gonna sign them to these contracts and sit them on the fucking bench. It's like, what is the point of this? You know, we want to perform. We're down here. We we had. We, um, so we decided we were going to um, make some phone calls and we were going to address the issue with David directly. <laughs> and it was basically like, you know what, I'll quit. Fuck you. I don't need this show. Y'all are wasting me. You know what you have here? We will walk, man. We ain't had nowhere to walk. We ain't have shoes. But we were still... <laughs> we were set to go. We felt it was so incredibly frustrating. It was like, no, there's going to be a big payoff at the end of the season. Like, yeah, the end no, of the season. No, no, that, you, you, boy, you cheated it. You cheated yeah, it. No, 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 you no, give no. it to us, David, please. I'm on the I'm edge give of it my to you. seat. Okay, so they, they come in and they make their big pitch, which, <laughs> and all the shots were, remember they were doing like all this surveillance. Uh -huh, right. they, in yes. fact, yes. That we were like making, so, like, we, like they just sat on houses <laughs> and they were like, and they were coming up with nothing and nothing. Finally, they sit on a house and the guy, it was, uh, 
uh, Nikki Spaki. He's already been arrested. Like he was arrested in the previous episode. They're still sitting on the house because nobody told them <laughs> he was arrested. You remember that? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So at some point they co they come in and they say, you know, Tom and Seth come in. They're like, look, nothing's happening with our characters. We're not being developed. We're not, we don't feel like we're being properly used. That we're being effectively used in whatever it is you're building. And I go, just like these two guys in the case, they're getting frustrated, right? <laughs> goes, yeah, but what I'm saying is, you know, I've called my agent. <laughs> I go, so you're really frustrated, right? Yeah. Now, how do you remember the conversation? Like, yeah. Yeah. So these yeah. guys, they, they really feel as if they're being, you know, uh, neglected. Right. And he goes, yes, yes, they do. And, <laughs> just, and, and there came this moment where I said, use it. Use it. Use I it. promise. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and it's a, you know, he took the sword. Just, I, it, it, we know where it went. But. Yeah, Dom, Dom Lombardozzi was, he was really buoyed by that. Buoyed? I was not so much. Yeah, he was like, oh, oh, cool. right, it makes perfect sense, you know what I mean? I wish they would have trusted us a little more. We're telling us what was going on. You know, I kind of, you know what I mean? That would have been good, but this is fucking great, though. This is fucking great. It's gonna turn into something, man. It's gotta turn into something. I will fucking knock David Simon out. <laughs> so 50% yeah. so, so penetration on my bullshit is pretty good. Yeah. 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 I turn one of you. Exactly. <laughs> um, Nina, how did the relationship between the show and the city of Baltimore change over the years, or was it roughly the same in terms of your interactions with politicians and other people? Um, well, it was easy the first season because we were mostly filming in abandoned row houses where there was really nobody to ask <laughs> permission, even if we wanted to. You know, we, we would look around for, for homeowners, but often, you know, it's just a matter of taking down the boards and, and going in and, and filming. And then second season, um, David and Ed came up with the story of the port, and so we went to the to the port, and you know, we said we want to do the story about these uh, women, you know, in a can that are come up dead. And they said, no, thank you. We, we really don't want to be involved in that. <laughs> Thanks anyway. <laughs> so, um, so that was a new experience for us, being, being turned down and me having to tell David, you know, you can't shoot anywhere you want in Baltimore, you know, even though you think you can. So that was, that was, that was a process of, uh, of talking our way back in, mm. in there. But, um, you know, th and then there was the politics and certain people who thought some of the characters were maybe based on them. And <laughs> that, that made life a little rough for us at, at times. But um, I think for the most part, I think we pretty much flew, flew under the radar for the, for the most part. I mean, there are people, politicians in Baltimore that still haven't gotten over it. And in fact, the <laughs> entire um, film industry in, in Baltimore kind of collapsed um, because yeah. of us. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if it was all us, but I, we probably contributed in some way in that the guy who became the governor, who felt a particular uh, animus to the show, um, when the chips were down in 2008 and he had to cut his budget, he, one of the things he cut was the film incentives. And you know, if you know anything about how the film industry works, a lot of business left Maryland. And, and I couldn't help but think it was such a bad decision because you know, the incentives, it's basically you don't, you don't get a tax give back until you're paying in, you know, it's, 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 it's not a, you're not giving that's anything. You're not giving price anything price out. That's not a percentage of everything that's coming in. Mm -hmm. um, it was such a terrible decision, but he was extremely emotional about the wire. Mm -hmm. yeah. He's running for president now, so <laughs> you know, I'm sure you all have a chance to <laughs> in engage with him. On yeah, here's a softball. What character did he think he was? He, he, he was the bunk. <laughs> Born politician. What was it like for, for you as actors to be living in this city and, and going around in it as the show was on, and especially as it went on in years and more people got to know it? Did, did the citizens of Baltimore seem sort of possessive of you, or how did, how did that go? The people of Baltimore are great. I love Baltimore. It, it was what I look forward to every year. You know, I knew I was going to get a new apartment in a different part of town, and we were going <laughs> to be hanging out. And I love this. There was this one club. And, 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 you know, people started to see you in the characters that you were, you know, and uh, so everybody thought I was real police. Uh, <laughs> so I would dress up in a suit and tie and go to Choices. The Choices was on... Choices on North Street. Oh, on North Street. Street. Yeah. North Street. And, you know, that, uh -huh. man, it was North like, Street. I met... Going that. to Choices? I choices? loved going into Choices. I got man. violated in and, Choices. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> it was a whole, it was, violated there, were, there were a whole lot of Omars and Barksdales and everybody in what? choices. Oh man, and I would, and they were like, bug, bunk, you know, all these kids would come up, yeah, you real police, I'll take you out, you know. <laughs> uh, but it was great, so you had that experience, but then I also got to know a lot of the real police and uh, doing ride-alongs and uh, with detectives, one in particular was Sergeant Massey, who, you know, he was always clean, he, you know, always suit and tie and straight up, and he would love to interrogate people, you know, in front of me, let me show you all the tricks of the trade, you know. <laughs> Um, and then I also met the real bunk, and uh, that was great. Right at the beginning of the show, I meet the real bunk and in the courthouse, and uh, Rick Requeer, and uh, and I'll never forget the first day we were shooting. He came in his caddy with his big cigar, drove up and parked in the distance, and got out as the bunk, and looked at me. <laughs> The <laughs> <laughs> got back in his car and drove off. <laughs> and after that, that was the first day, and I didn't talk to him for five years. <laughs> but I was terrified of what his review was going to be, and I was in the barbershop one time, and the guy said, you know, the bunk is retiring. And I said, oh, no, I got to go. So I went there, man, and I walk in, and he's standing there and sta looking at me the same way. <laughs> And then he finally said, oh, boy, you made me a star. Come here. <laughs> <laughs> and we're actually, we're actually going to hook up for the Baltimore Saints game on November 21st in New Orleans. So oh, I'm still in touch with the bunk. I, I wonder if there was, I, I imagine you guys get this a lot in terms of just confusing you with the character. I'm wondering if it was more for those of you who played cops or those of you who played criminals, where it's just they, they have difficulty separating the actor and the character. I had a few kids on the subway in New York say, Aren't you my teacher? You're my teacher. <laughs> I, I had you for fifth grade, right? So I was definitely confused. Oh, for, a teacher. <laughs> for me, it wasn't so much the cop thing. It was like, you really like that? I mean, you know, you like that? <laughs> I mean, you know, because I think you're sexy. Yeah. So it was all about, you know, are you a lesbian or aren't you a lesbian? <laughs> they knew I wasn't a cop. <laughs> I've had many cops come up to me and say, I work for an asshole just like you. <laughs> I don't know, Jamie, did you get a lot of people just sort of having trouble separating fact from fiction? I mean, you know, for the most part, uh, I think everybody thought I sold drugs and they would ask me if I want to move a package or two. <laughs> just simple things like that. But, yeah. And what did you tell them? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you, you talked before about what it was like to come into the show mm. later in the run. Most of you on the stage here were on the show from the first season. We have a couple of people in the audience who came in later, both, both Tristan and Bob. What was it like for, for the two of you to join the show after it had been on for a few years? One, just, can, I, can, I, can I just say something I'm real sure. quick? I, I just want to acknowledge my wife, Michelle Paris, who also yeah, played Alma right. Gutierrez in the show. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Because she came, in, she came in much, much later on the end. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> check, check, one, two. Uh, <laughs> coming into the show late, it was, it was, uh, it was crazy because uh, me and my mom watched it. You know, me and that was probably like one of our Sunday rituals. She got me on to like season three, and then I think that was around the time that HBO on demand came out. So I was able to go back and watch like the first and second season. And then I remember um, it was when Stringer died and. Then, you know, a year later, they had these auditions. And my mom's like, oh, The Wire's having auditions. I'm like, where are they going to go f now? Like, Stringer's dead. There's nothing else <laughs> to show. <laughs> Spoken <laughs> like Chris Albrecht. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, then I, then I went out for the audition. And, um, and uh, I, I, j I just, because I already knew the character, I already knew the place. Like, I knew the, the, the whole scope of the show, it um I was so excited to be a part of it. Good, Bob. So um, yeah, it was um, it was a strange kind of thing because I I had gone up for the corner, and uh, and I wasn't able to do it because this movie came through. It, but the corner was like I knew those rocks. I mean, you know, Baltimore, D.C. I grew up in D.C. So when that came around, uh, I was doing this show, this movie, Ray. We were down in New Orleans, and uh, 
and like everyone else, I became a fan of the show. Uh, I had originally gone up for String of Bell, so go figure. <laughs> 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 but, you know, and actors have this thing where, you know, if they don't get the part, they don't watch the show. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, for, thank you. Now I don't have to. You, you know. know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, but when the part, when you know, I became a fan of the show like three, four episodes in. So I was, you know, when it came up, I told my agent, "Don't screw this up." You know, this is. And I went to set, and I remember David and uh, Robert walked me in the trailer, and it was the end of season two, and they presented this character. And the character was in a whole bunch of scenes, but didn't have a lot of words. And I was like, you know, feeling like Larry, like, what the fuck's going on? <laughs> <laughs> you know? But after I went back and looked at it, the whole skeleton of the character was right there in the end of the of that of that uh, second season. I mean, everything was there. The looks they got to be too, all of this stuff. And that's when I knew we were on to something. You know, it was one of those kind of movies. Now, the show added people over the years. Of course, it also lost people over the years. We have a couple on stage who, who were killed off. Uh, Bodie, we lost tragically at the end of season four. I'm curious, JD, what, what's it like? <laughs> I'm curious, what's it, from your point of view, what's it like to be killed on the wire? Like, when did you find out? Is there any kind of ritual that happened? Well, I'm, glad I, got, I'm glad you got that one. Dude. Yeah, I think I, I, <laughs> in general, in general, I'm pretty sure most people probably didn't get too much advance notice before you got taken off. But I think there's tears to it, and uh, there's some characters like you might have a fruit per se, and maybe like the way he was taken out was kind of a little more graphic or you know brutal. I I have to really thank David for the way he handled. Bodie because um, I felt I felt like I got special treatment the way it was going down like it was pages coming out and he would just send them they would be messengered and then he he would pull me to the side and we would talk and he would you know start explaining things to me like a little bit earlier and it was like this extra extra secrecy around it actually so I felt really you know taken really well care of as an actor and as a character I, I, and and uh and and by the time it was time for my character to go like the buildup of it was just so. It was time, you know? I was ready as an actor and I was ready as a character. I remember I was doing a lot of scenes with the younger kids that, that last season, and, and I mean, I hung out with them a lot. Like, we spent the whole lot of time together hanging out, we had a ball, and uh, at lunchtime, they would sit with me most of the time. And we would talk about the characters as I do, at, at, about the story as I do with the older characters, but the young ones, they would say, well, what you think is gonna happen? And I would say, well, I think Bodie's gonna get killed this year. And they would all say, don't say that out loud. Don't, don't say that. <laughs> and like, David's sitting right over there. Like, he might hear you. <laughs> like, but, you know, that's the way to, I feel like the character's yeah. gonna go. That's what's gonna happen. And I remember David sat with us one day and I said it in front of him. And I mean, I saw all of their eyes just pop out of their head. Like, why is he killing himself right now? But, but it was just the thing to where I felt like, like I said, the. The, the project as itself was alive and it was breathing and, mm -hmm. and, and, and it was just so much love and respect that I felt like it was time and I, and I, I love the way it was going and, and I couldn't ask for a better J JD, ensemble. J.D. took it best <laughs> of anybody. <laughs> Not only what, what you left out is J.D. really took it best as anybody. He really, he, like normally you had to do a little bedside manner like, hey, you know, but it's a good death scene, you know, but um, <laughs> J.D. was like, he guessed it. Like at some point, he's looking at one of the scenes, one of those scenes with McNulty. It wasn't the one, the big one in the in the in the arboretum. It was the one a little earlier. We eating? Yeah, in in Bills in the sub shop, and he said, "I'm having this much words with a cop, and get you know, there's like, and you actually said, you know, like once char on this show, once characters start raising up and having like a little bit of respect for each other." That's when the bullet comes. <laughs> he said, "So I know, I know, I don't have long." Like he, he actually guessed it. I was like, "Well, I wouldn't say you don't have long." <laughs> um, all of a sudden, I was like backing up on it because Tom Fontana, who uh, a guy who mentored me in television and 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 Nina as well, he said something to me one time. He said, "You know," uh, he said, "If you tell an actor, you know, if the, uh, episodes in advance, or you know." Then all of a sudden, everything in the scripts leading up to that, every single line, you know, uh, past the potatoes, past the potatoes, might be the last time you ever taste potatoes, man. <laughs> like every, it's even for trained, you know, actors. 
measuring everything against the fact that you know human beings don't know their own death. They don't know the moment of their own death, and, and, that, and that, so that's why we go. If we did, we could barely go through the day. So it's a, it's the kind of thing that like, yeah, I had a lot of moments of coming to guys' trailers with the newly published script. You know, two days before and going, good news and bad news. You know, I I, I had that, but there really was a method to the to the cruelty. You know, uh, and something that Sonia studied also which is we started to realize that uh, people are doing really great work and this was a special time and when that moment came out of respect for the work that the actors were doing we we missed a couple but we said we need to we need to go and show support and I remember Sonia would really mm -hmm. gather us and say you know they're yeah, shooting his death thing. scene uh, this day let's try to make it out you know it's gonna take a couple of hours so over the course of those hours we would go uh, out of respect for the actor and the work that they've done, and uh, and, and, and that was a, a tradition that Sonia started that I really loved. I think we all. No, Nina. No, I just wanted to say it was it was amazing how much of, again, how much of a, a family we all were. That after, you know, a whole a whole season. I remember um, also everyone's last scene of the season because we never knew if we were coming back. We were never renewed. Mm -hmm. um, and so we were all saying goodbye at the end of every single year. Mm -hmm. And that everybody would show up for everybody's last scene, mm -hmm. you know, and, yeah. and there would be a lot of um, goodbyes and, you know, we hope you see you again, you know. And this happened for five years. And actually, the fifth season, we thought we were canceled. Mm -hmm. I mean, and everybody was let go. Yeah, you know? well, I got to say that. Yeah, we I mean, were, there came a moment where, the decision, they delayed the decision on whether we were ever coming back until after the actors' contracts lapsed, meaning we were not holding anybody. And I had to call everybody and say, uh, you know, if we're going to finish the show, everyone's going to have to come back. And not only that, like they're trimming a couple of episodes, they, they got to come back. Like we can't, you know, we can't just pay out everybody for 12 if we're only shooting 10. We don't have the money because they, they held our budget. So it was like, on the one hand, I'm telling HBO, listen, if it's about that, I'll get, I'm, I'm actually acting like, you know, I, if it's about the actors, they'll all come back to a man. I'm saying this, but I'm not sure we actually believed it until we actually put the calls out and, to a man. I and mean, we didn't, you know, there every wasn't. Every single person came can, back and said we're there. We're said we're there, there, you know, and, and, and nobody tried to, like, yeah. you know, okay, I'm free. I, I want, you know, I, you know, send a bigger trailer and I want a bigger car. And, uh, there was nothing of that. It was all like, this is the work, you know? The other thing that happened was that the actors operated as a department like on no other show that I've ever been on. There was a time when, um, you know, everybody brought their game to the show and everybody had to every day. It's, you know, Larry and Seth, you've said it, you know, everybody had, and Michael, everybody had felt the burden of responsibility that was on each one of you and each one of us to to make this thing happen. It, it took everybody working together. But um, there was a, a time when um, there, was, there was an actor that was coming and maybe not so prepared as he used to be. I think in the fourth season, mm -hmm. um, he'd show up and sometimes not know his lines that well. And I thought, because one of my many jobs is to make sure that everyone else is doing their job. Mm -hmm. And I thought, OK, I'm going to have to have the talk. I'm going to have to go in there and say, you know, you really have to. And before I had a chance to do that, we were shooting at a hotel. And it was some ungodly hour, 2 in the morning or whatever. And all of a sudden, I realized that, where are the actors? Well, they're all in this one hotel room. And there was like a lot of you there, even ones that weren't working. And everyone went into this one room. Do you guys remember this, when you staged the intervention? <laughs> <laughs> there was an intervention. Yeah. yeah. And, and and I don't I wasn't in the room, but suddenly there was no problem anymore. I've never well, I can tell I've you. never I don't had a self policing cast. This, but it was it was pretty incredible. It was amazing. I mean, they were self policing. It was there was like there, there was there was there was some people like man, don't mess up my job. <laughs> <laughs> no, but 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 you know, but it was, it was there's sort of up. a little perfect storm that's come together for me to tell the story. Um, this, the way we handled death, death, you know, death was ever present mm. um, uh, on, on this on this show, of course. And for me, especially, you know, I was able to kind of rise to the occasion because I was the first one to escape a bullet um, during when I found out. David, you mind if I share this? No, go ahead. Um, when I found out accidentally at, during the last, I guess I think the the 
just before I was about to shoot my last scene of the pilot, when uh, Melanie, I go to meet Melanie, and Melanie, uh, my, my girlfriend, Cheryl, for the first time, and we're all like, you know, having, you know, giggles. And she says, yeah, I really wanted the role of Kima. And I was like, oh, no, but you got a great role. And I'm just kind of, you know, letting that trickle off my back and trying to move forward. Um, and she said, you know, but, but yeah, the director told me that, you know, the characters died in the fifth episode. Anyway, so. <laughs> <laughs> and I went, what? <laughs> Kaplop. And, uh, and David and I, you know, have a whole, you know, conversation, you know, around it. Um, but yes, I guess. Did. <laughs> what, what? Yes, we did. Yeah, we had a, we have a, we have a big cover. And, and, and again, and David has one of these moments where he talks about the importance of it. It's going to resonate some larger theme. You know, she's the moral center of the police department, whatever. And, you know, I really don't give a shit at this point because I just <laughs> come off of two years of unemployment um, and now going, oh, fuck, what am I going to do now? Um, but, you know, um, I think having been in that position was really interesting for me. I think it taught me about this business, first of all. Um, and I, and whenever an actor was going to die or heard that they were going to die or whatever, you know, I tried to help them understand that it's not to take it personally. It's not about, you know, it's not about the, the David or, you know, the writers. It's, it's a story. We're, we're here to serve a story. Um, and then I think also what happened, you know, what we started to see was, was, was we became so close. Um, I had such a rough time that first season. Uh, most of the people who worked in scenes with me, I know you knew. I know you knew because we talked about it. You had to see it because you were in the room. That first season was torture for me. I was coming to, I did not, I would study my lines for, for hours for a whole weekend and come to, the, come to this set and just draw blanks. It, later, later, after the show ended, I realized what had happened, this, that this story was resonating, um, resonating some sort of unfinished business in my own life. My brother had been a teenage drug dealer. My brother had been murdered. The low rises looked a lot like the apartment complex I grew up in. And I was basically being triggered. And I, and my work wasn't there. And these guys, they were the first to be there for me. Andre held me down. We had some conversations. You and I had some conversations, but Andre held me down. You know, kept me, kept me in there. I wanted to quit. I was about to quit. I was like, fuck the money. This is not worth it. I'm, I'm suffering. I'm drowning. And I think because I had both of those experiences when, we, you know, and we became, we became close. And like I said, we were growing and developing and learning all together, having shit fits over stuff. You would never do that on a set now, you mm -hmm. know, when these things happen with your care. You, you, you know, you, you know the business now, right? We didn't know the business back then, you know? But we were all bonding over some, you know, over, over death. Um, which I think was resonating for all of us, you know, differently. And, um, and because we had such a strong bond, we wanted to honor each other. And, uh, yeah, it, it's, it was a beautiful experience and something that um, I don't think will ever be repeated in my career. I'll, mm. so I'll tell you now, uh, Sonia, that the, 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 the person who really did the most talking, who saved your character, was Carolyn Strauss at HBO. Mm -hmm. Carolyn Strauss, uh, <coughs> when she, because she knew the storyline, it was, it was actually, it wasn't actually episode five, it was later in the run, but mm -hmm. when you got shot, you, originally we'd conceived of it as a, that you would be killed. Yeah. And uh, Carolyn got to about episode six, watching cuts of the show. I, I don't think we'd quite aired yet, maybe it was about episode five. And she said, you know, don't, don't be killing Kima. Don't be killing Kima. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, when I was having do a you want to have a show? Do you want? Mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> no. I, she didn't. She didn't say that. But she was. She loved the character. She loved what you did with it. And she was uh, like, "That's a mistake. That's a mistake." Girl power. <laughs> and trust me, as we were shooting that season, and I was screwing it up. Okay, because David said, "Listen." There's someone, you did tell me, there's someone high up in the food chain that really loves this character, so the jury's still out on that. And when we come back, That's if I told we, you on the, when you called we, me on the phone, if, I said, if we come back, yeah, we're still arguing over it. Yeah, 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 you know, I should know. Wow. But I tell you something, as I was screwing it up, you know, and you can see it on the dailies, but you know, y'all cut it together real nice, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, you know, I had that, I was like, and I, it, when she got shot, I was like, shit, is she gonna die? Did I really screw it up? <laughs> but yeah, you know, we went through a lot together. It was a beautiful experience. And we were fans of each other's work. I mean, yeah, yeah. as a homicide detective, I never saw any of these guys. 
never in, until they were down and dead, you know? Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and I had a great scene, you know, my great scene with Idris. Oh, yep, yeah, he did. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, I mean, it, 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 I was such a fan of the show because of that. I mean, because we were working in silos, partying together, though. Right. Uh, <laughs> it's a great time. But, you know, it just, it, it, things just constantly resonated. I, I, I mean, one of my favorite moments is, you know, when, when Seth is in the hospital with Randy. Mm. You know, and he walks yeah. away. That moment, I told him downstairs, you know, what, what now, Sergeant Carver? I mean, that mm -hmm. kills me every time. And I have to uh, say... Uh, you know, Bob with the bottle in the bag speech. Yeah. You know? I mean, it's just, it's just constant awesome. moments. Larry with, with pawns, you know? <laughs> uh, you're the pawn. The king is the, you know? The king man. stay the king. King stay the king. The king. king stay the king. And baby. it's just amazing moments like that that fans have, uh, have pointed out that we actually appreciated while they were happening. That, yeah. you know, we'll never forget. I, I mean, when... when Presbo is giving everything to Dookie. Yeah. You know? It's uh, crazy. It's like, because it crosses over seasons. It's like the family. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It crosses over seasons. There are people who I didn't work with because I was done when I was done who were in season four. I remember meeting this cat here, and, and you know, he started in season four. He come up as just like a little brother. It's like we're all a part of the family. Right. And it's just such a special thing. Mm -hmm. I've you never know, experienced that. You know, ever. and, and one. No, go ahead, go ahead. You know, one thing that I realized also when working on going into the fourth season, I, I looked at the pages and I said, um, David and Nina, that's the real Marlowe. They putting people in row houses based on the material mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that I read. And the reason why I thought that is because the line that I said, my name is my name, mm -hmm. one thing you have to understand, we're fans of these guys on the set because they kind of move in silence, right? So it's Ed Burns, David Simon. Mm -hmm. Nina Cave Nobles that barely ever speak. Mm -hmm. And as an actor, you want to be directed by directors. You want them to give you a direction. So for that scene right there, Nina came over, and she barely ever spoke, never said a word, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, all just, yeah, they would stand there and just watch. You know what you're doing, just do it. But for that scene, she came, and she said, Jamie, let me talk to you. And I said, hey, she said, for this scene right over here, it's as if Goldman Sachs was being ran through trash. And somebody was talking about them and tearing them down. And they had to stand up for their name. I was never directed by this lady. She barely ever spoke on set. Then she gave me that word, right? So in silence, watching these guys move in silence, watching them barely say anything, and then her giving me the word is actually the thing also that motivated and inspired me to do the work that I did on that show and in that scene. That, that sets us up nicely. We have a question here uh, that was submitted via the Paley app. Um, they want to know, is there one scene that any of you were involved in that you feel really encapsulates what The Wire was about? Mm. Ooh. Man, it's too much. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a big one. <laughs> one. I had a thought. You know, it's not a, it wasn't a big scene, but it, it does encapsulate the ensemble nature of the thing for me. I was, you know, up till season three, in this, um, on the detail, and then in season four, I'm in the schools, and there was this great moment where Bonk and Freeman come to the school to ask about Randy, and we have this very, really well-written, beautiful scene with some real a acting demands, and it was like um, something I, I just could not have even imagined could ever take place, you know, <laughs> both because of the, the 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 depth of the work that was required. And, even though it wasn't like a lot of fireworks, it was this really intense, you know, toe-to-toe -to -toe acting. And it was like with this huge arc of my character going from being a police to being in the schools and then facing some old colleagues, you know, it was all wrapped up. If I could offer... I, I, I had the privilege of working with, at that time, the kids in year four. Extraordinary, incredible, incredible group of kids. Kids, yes, sir. <laughs> I, I don't call you kid anymore, though. <laughs> but um, we were working in the classroom with, my classroom was a, a group of raw kids. Um, the ones who carried big roles were, had some training behind them and, and they were rolling, but these kids were raw. And there was a day that this one in the storyline when a, one of my students 
who was a, you know, just on the fence. He was a pretty good kid, but he had his ways. He goes home and he finds his uh, grandma dead on the couch. And he had to carry this. And we, the great, late, great Robert Cole, God bless him, mm. um, was working with them. And we all went into this room with them to just really, with a, I think it was probably no more than nine, 10, to really dig up these really deep emotions so he could carry it. And this guy went there. And it was like this incredible moment in this closet that we sort of just eased out into the classroom. And take after take after take, he was in that place. And I think that's what, what The Wire, if you can say that, it, it said everything right there. That's what we were about. We used a lot of people who were just Baltimoreans um, and, and in increasingly uh, significant roles. I mean, it was, we had a lot of trained, talented actors who would often be put in scenes. I remember you were famously put in a scene where everywhere you looked, you were, you were, you, it, was the, it was the pool, the, the, yeah, I remember that scene. It was like, you could go too far. But, um, but there were these moments that it, it made the thing feel real because there was this, um, uh, this permeable or semi-permeable membrane between the artifice of making a television show and the real city that we were filming in and about. And so there would be these moments of, um, you know, when it worked, it was magical, like, you know, with Felicia and, and but, Sometimes we got ourselves in trouble. You know, we'd, we'd, we'd look around and say, you know, a, a real actor might help in this moment. <laughs> but, but every now and then, you know, you know it, it, it was worth the experiment. And, and it sort of brings up something, rather than try to pick a scene, which is, you know, because th that to me, the whole, let's pick a scene, which, which season is the favorite, which actor, you know, could Stringer beat up McNulty if they were on, you know. <laughs> It's like, I, I, li I listen to this shit and it's just like, Wow, you know, that's, that's where it all, you know, it all gets driven into its little components. But um, the real joy of doing this stuff, long form, is that it survives, if it survives, it survives long enough so that it builds to something where you actually can, can, can make a, a complete universe and have the universe argue something mm -hmm. to, or discuss something. Mm -hmm. And for that, every single person up here, the writers, the producers, the directors who are not represented tonight, but certainly the entire cast, down to all the departments. The amazing thing about film, the amazing that it's unlike, because you remember, I come out of prose, I come out of journalism and then book writing. Um, and there it's just, you know, it's you and your editor and maybe a copy desk looking over the editor's shoulder, and that's the story. It's, you know, it's right here, I can show it to you, it's a, it's a paper. But this is so collaborative, and it's so much bigger than the sum of any of us, and we're all, I used to have this metaphor, I used to tell it to everybody, but you know, it, it sounds almost dehumanizing, but I don't mean it that way. It's like we're building a house and we're all tools in a toolbox. And some of us are like, you know, this, this, here's a level, here's an awl, here's a ball peen hammer. Mm -hmm. You know, we all can do certain specialized things very well, but it, it doesn't work unless everybody sort of just kicks. And we're all very proud and we're all very, you know, we, we have certain talents that we're proud of and we worked hard at, but you gotta sort of put the ego and sort of like, just shut up for a while because we're doing something here, you know. And all of us. I mean, it, you know, I was in a writers' room with, you know, uh, you know Richard Price and Pelicanos and, and and Dennis Lehane. I had a writers' room like, you know, I, I, there were times where I was sort of like, you know, is Philip Roth here somewhere? <laughs> 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 Who didn't show up today? It was like, <laughs> and 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 all of us would have to say to each other, you know, um, sometimes no, nah, that's that sucks, you know, or that, yeah, we can do better than that, or no, you're wrong, you know, and we'd have to have arguments. And, and that, I, I admire that so much because I thought after The Wire that, well, now I know how you get that mad. Now I can do that every time. I'll just, <laughs> we'll have another show and everybody will get along and all the, everyone will behave <laughs> and nobody will argue for a bigger trailer and, you know, <laughs> and it was, no, it was pretty, <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I've worked with a lot of other good people on other shows and things have turned, but, but this, there's something happened somewhere along the line and it, it felt like everybody sort of knew that something bigger than the sum of the parts had a chance of happening. And, it, and the authenticity of it, it speaks to such a truth sure. in humanity. Someone mm -hmm. was saying how John and everyone was saying how people from different walks of life come and, and say to us as actors, who oh, I love The Wire, you know, and they speak as if it only spoke to them. If, if you can understand, I understand how it spoke to you. And it would be, you know, some little old lady on the Upper East Side, or, you know, some, you know, kid slinging on the corner, you know. Uh, 
it, and, and, it's, and it's, that's the thing that makes it classic. You know, it, speak, it speaks to the humanity of the characters and the world that David created, so much so that it's classic. It's going to speak to human beings after us. Mm -hmm. You're still, so it's hard to say just one scene in The Wire. It's the complexity of The Wire that makes it last on and on and on, and that complexity speaks to so much of our humanity, that different people from different walks of life, a disparate group of mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. come to it and speak, it, you know, and it says it speaks to them in a very special way. And almost to a person, we could go through scene after scene after scene of saying this is really about the wire, this is about the wire, this is about the wire. And I came to that realization when I actually considered leaving the wire. Mm -hmm. Because I, I can say publicly right now, I know we have favorite seasons and stuff, but with the kids and the schools, that's the best examination of the dysfunction of mm -hmm. what's happening in our society mm -hmm. ever depicted on screen. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, I had, and I had very little, as being a homicide detective, I had very little to do with the live kids. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was... <laughs> <laughs> It was, it, was at, um, it was at the rap party uh, when the young lady, uh, and I can't think of her name and I can't think of the character's name, uh, who slices the girl's face, yeah. came up to me, oh, Mr. Pierce, I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to work with you this year. This was really great. You know, oh, I'm so excited about being on the show. And, you know, I'm going to Brown next year on scholarship. And I'm like, whoa, who are you? You know? <laughs> Who are you on the show? You know, and she said, "Oh, I played Zenobia or whatever." You know, Zenobia. yeah, you know. And I was like, "Well, that's the girl who slices the face," and and I remember saying, "Wait a minute, why aren't we telling your story? You're going to Brown on honors and all, you know." That's right. Uh, and I was really like, "Man, are we a part of the problem?" Mm -hmm. You know. And then I went back and watched that season, mm -hmm. and realized that it was so impactful and touching to me that I knew we weren't arbitrary with the choices that we were making about the violence, about this dysfunction and everything, that actually we were telling stories that need to be told and, mm -hmm. uh, and that will speak for a long time. And those, man, those kids touched me mm -hmm. so much, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Touched me so much. What now, Sergeant Carver, what now? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. We are going to go to audience Q&A in just a moment, uh, so think up some good ones. But before we do that, um, David, what you were talking about before made me wonder. I, I know you've sort of said you don't really have an interest in bringing back the show, but do you ever find yourself just as a writer thinking to yourself, you know, I wonder what this character's up to now. I wonder what that character's up to now. Do any of you as actors? <laughs> <laughs> now, you know, listen, you can, uh, the stories work if they have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And we really did plan the end, the end had to be the end. Um, mm. And the last thing we wanted to say, very, in a fundamental way, was why is it that, you know, th th there's, th you know there's a million channels, there's a you know, hundred million channels, and there's all this, there's all this entertain entertainment. We're, we're a culture that's pretty much entertained ourselves to death. And, um, and there was this one show for a little while that, you know, I used to be very proud when people like Andre, would come out of, uh, or, or Michael, or is usually the street characters, but it could often be the detectives too. Um, they would come out of the trailer and we'd be shooting somewhere in West Baltimore. And it would be like, you know, we're on Calhoun Street or something. And, and it'd come out and there was like, somebody finally made a television show about this America. Mm -hmm. It was like, all of a sudden, it was like to see people rally around you know, Andre Royo, you, you know, yo, Bubs, Bubs, you know, like, and, and they would come and they would, like, bleed out their stories to, you know, about a cousin, and, and it was just so beautiful. It was like nothing, there's a whole universe that doesn't get, that isn't sufficient for narrative in most people's minds. And this show was a very improbable thing that managed to last for a while. And that, to me, was... It, it was important to, like, what it, the reason it ended with the media, the reason that we ended with the idea of, 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 of the storytelling and, and the newspaper, the reason that had to be the last season was because, you know, a guy who's not up here and who really deserves, like, he, it was a thankless role of Tom McCarthy, of the reporter who, who is the, mm -hmm. the fabulous who makes it up. Mm -hmm. But the reason that, uh, what we're trying to say, what, I, what, what the writers were trying to say there was, 
even when you get close to something like this, people use it as a grist for melodrama, for the, for the things that are like, you know, like, like, let's revel in some gangsters, or let's, you know, or let's have some tough cops, or let's enjoy the violence, or let's have the, the thrill of the chase or the ticking time bomb. And, you know, I, I, it was like there was a little part of me that wanted to say, pay attention to what gets pulled through the keyhole and what doesn't. Because what we just said was these four seasons, the previous four seasons, and what you've seen of this last season are the, are, are, are the part of the iceberg that never, that's under the water. And, it rare, and in this one show, it sort of poked up uh, above the water. And we actually made sort of a meta comment about all the stories, you know, what happens in that season was all the stuff never gets told. The newspaper's full of sort of empty, empty you know, with the exception of one good story at the end about bubbles. And, one, and it was really a part of us that wanted to say, we, 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 told, we used it to good effect. And now to, to do another season or something where it would just be, well, we're sustaining the franchise. You know, we're, you know, we, we, you know if they want more, when they want more bubbles, let's get bubbles. Bubbles starts getting high again, you know. But then, but then he'll, he'll get clean again, and then, mm. and then the bubbles. Is, you know, he'll, he, maybe he dies, but then his twin brother shows. It's, it's like, <laughs> you know, and then right, Stringer right, right. comes back, and you know, and and, and Omar really wasn't dead. And like, you know, sustaining <laughs> the fr sustaining the franchise is the great disease of of American television. Mm. Uh, and. and so, we'll all do something else. We'll build a barn in the backyard and we'll make a new story and we'll all be in it and it'll be fine. <laughs> I love go. that. I love that. I, I, yeah, yeah, me too. <laughs> I, I just, I have to add, add something here. I, there's been, there's not been enough conversation about how great this freaking writing was. You keep pointing out these scenes. No, there's been plenty. It's I, no, I just know. <laughs> I don't know. Because I've wallowed I, I, in it quite well, thank no, you. No, no, I just feel like it, we've been talking a lot about you know, the scenes in terms of the actors and what we've, how they affected us and what was, but, you know, that chess scene, that chess scene, the, the, the bag and the bottles, there's so many scenes that were literary. So how you make it, you know, create a piece of, you know, television that reaches the common person up from all walks of life and also as literary. Has there ever been any conversation around like publishing the script so you could read the scripts as though it, it were a novel? I think that'd be I, th I think it'd be great to publish I think I think that would be fascinating. That would be great. I would like that. And, and I just want to thank you because I want to tag on to this, co this comment that you were having about what story, we had this conversation because somewhere, I don't know if you and I had this conversation, David, I heard this from Ed or someone we were at the end of the third season, I think, and Stringer was dying, and there was, you know, we were always talking about why, you know, very, you know, why, why, why all this stuff is happening. And Stringer was basically like the hope of that Barksdale, of, of that Barksdale family, you know. And I don't know if you and I had this conversation, or, or I think we did, or I think it, maybe it came through just, you know, talk among, you know, on the set. But there was, I believe you told me at one point, we'll, we'll be all the. Something about it wasn't maybe about Stringer, but but every season ended so bleakly, and there was some talk about because there's, and this is paraphrasing probably there's there, it it reflects that there is no hope in the world, <laughs> and initially I took offense to that, and you and I had a conversation about it I think around the time you were having this this you know you were processing this other piece, and then it hit me later, after I started doing you know, the work in the Baltimore community. It isn't, yes, the, the, the greater question that the show put to humanity is why is there no hope in the ghetto for some people, for a, group, for a certain population of people in this country? Why is that? And we need to put that under an, underneath the microscope because and David, in, in your you know in your recent appearances and in, in your blog, you know you talk a lot about why why these circumstances and situations exist for certain people, and that's what the what the show you know ultimately was was all about, and the great purpose of the show, and why it's been such an honor to be a part of something that really enlightened and awakened Americans to what is really happening in this country the unfairness, the injustice, and the fact that people shouldn't have to be put in these positions to make these choices that really, you know, are no-win situations. And to be a part of a project like that that's had such an impact 
um, throughout the world, but in this country, we wouldn't be looking at education the way we're looking at it if, if, if it wasn't for this fourth season. This fourth season spurned people to action. When you're out there on, in activist circles, which I was involved in for a few years, you start to realize that the change agents who are out there trying to change policy and 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 create programming and, and whatnot to make this world, you know, make this country better, you know, were so influenced by this show and what David and the writers' room and the producers did. Um, it, it, there's no greater honor as an actor to be able to be a part of a project that changes lives and awakens and enlightens and entertains. That's why I'm here. It's such. A All right, I think we have time for at least a couple of questions. Does anyone have one? Right back there. Just wait for the microphone, please, so that people on the live stream can hear you. Hi, I'm all the way from San Diego. I made it a point to get on a plane and use my miles to come wow. to this. <laughs> I do not understand why there was no Emmy for this show. <laughs> Maybe because it was too real. But I loved it. I love it. I have every season. I watch it. I rewatch it. My husband loves loves it too. He couldn't get m the miles, so that's why he's from San Diego. But <laughs> I love the show and I love the cast. And thank you so much for having us, Paley. All right. So we're way in the back in the white shirt. Hi. Uh, this question is for David. Thank you guys so much for everything you've said. Um, and, you know, I drove, um, I didn't come from San Diego, but I drove from uh, upstate New York where I was actually um, negotiating uh, standards for the nurses union that I work for around um, Ebola, uh, around Ebola protocols. But um, my question is really, I read one time, David, that you said the one thing that just this show was trying to say was um, that we had to end the drug war. And subsequent to that, I've seen other things that you've written in your blog. and. And as a person who personally was greatly affected by the drug war, as a veteran of the drug war, um, as, with a conviction and everything, I, um, I relate to that. But I'm wondering if would you say now that the more important thing that this show was saying was really um, relating to the issue of income inequality and the level of inequality that exists in this society? Yeah, I think I did enough interviews. Let me say this. Uh, <laughs> if the show had had the Sopranos ratings, I probably could have been a lot more enigmatic and done a lot less interviews and just said, the show is about what you think it's about. <laughs> <laughs> but I had to sell like a motherfucker <laughs> to get anybody, like, you know, I was like, you know, <clears throat> I'm doing like, I'm doing like, and this is a deer, and you know, so, <laughs> to, to be, I'm, you know, there's Charles de Gaulle, I mean, I'm, <laughs> the amount of shtick I had to do, you know, right up to the end, because the, the show was always in danger of not being renewed. Um, I said the show was about a lot of stuff. Um, and, and I don't think I ever said the show was about something it wasn't about, but you know, I was always grabbing onto something that was, you know, okay, we're doing education, so now it'll be. But I think it's fair to say the show was most overtly about the failure of the drug war because that was the, um, the universe that we were spending a lot of time in. And it's, you know, it, it was a point of, um, it was where the rubber hit the road in terms of narrative. Um, but yeah, it's about the other America. It's about the people that got left behind. Mm -hmm. that, that, that runs through all five episodes. And it's about the, the fact that we are now very comfortable um, living and experiencing uh, different qualitative and different you know, uh, cultures, uh, societies and cultures. You know, I live 20 blocks away from a completely different Baltimore. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that, that's schizophrenia. Um, on the part of our society, I don't think is sustainable. And I, and, and I look at sort of the, 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 the libertarian impulse that has become almost a, a subtext of, of our political structure of, you know, I, I'm not given. I, I got mine. Fuck you. Mm -hmm. that, that's become the culture of, of, a, of a fading society, of a second-rate society. And I think, you know, ultimately, um, hard choices have to be made, and, and a hard decision, a hard definitive decision has to be made of, are we all in this together or are we not? And I think The Wire was depicting a dystopia where we are not. Mm -hmm. mm. Right, uh, right down in front, right there. Um, in the public uh, imaginary of the drug trade, we, we usually see in television represented um, 
um, drug lords or drug traffickers that come from Latin America and cross the border and, and bring their damage and violence uh, across. And, and yet, in The Wire, you, I don't remember a Latin American character ever um, being present in, 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 the, in the drama at all. And, I, and I was, for me, that was very refreshing, you know, to, to, to see. Uh, <laughs> let, let some other ethnic group bear the burden. <laughs> right, right. So I was wondering. Somebody else's turn. <laughs> I was wondering how, uh, how deliberate was that, that the centering of the imaginary of the drug trade being a domestic issue entirely it, and a I, systemic issue within the I'll, US. I can do this really quickly. Baltimore um, is a city that is 65% African American. Until the last 10 years, we had a very, very strangely minor, uh, like 2 3% Latino population. Mm -hmm. it, it almost like you know Chicago, very heavy Latino population. New York, you know, everything on the East Coast, Philadelphia. There was something about Baltimore until relatively recently, in the last decade or so, there was just no presence. All, um, all my years growing up there, I never met a Latin person in Baltimore. <laughs> Through all my years of school, right. I now, never met. Now on Upper Broadway in the Southeast, now, now you do. But we used to have more, I'm not kidding, like there was a bigger community of Lumbay Indians. <laughs> that was a huge thing in Southeast Baltimore. Mm -hmm. Lumbay, a whole tribe from Lumberton, North Carolina that came up and settled for the war work in the 40s. We had, we had thousands and thousands of Lumbay Indians and nobody from Mexico or from Puerto Rico or, Puerto Rico, or, or anywhere in Latin America. It was oh, wow. it's a weird city. But, so we were just following what we knew, you know. Yeah. All right, um, right over there in the glasses. Uh, just wait for the microphone, please. Uh, oops, sorry, down there. So, th <laughs> many people are wearing glasses, I'm, my apologies. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Maureen. I came all the way from Brooklyn, by the way. <laughs> I was here a few years ago when you did the thing here, and I asked you why you use the same song by different artists um, for the first three seasons, and you told me no special reason. And then I was reading Stealing Life, <laughs> and you had a two-page explanation of why you used the different. <laughs> <laughs> why did you lie to her, David? <laughs> you know. But I do <laughs> want to say thank you for the writing. Thank you for Treme. Thank you for depicting addicts as people because nobody gets that right. Mm. Nobody gets Thanks. that right. Mm. They're always one dimensional heroes or martyrs and um, Andre should be here. But thank you. Jumped up thank there. you all for the wire. Yeah. It was Thanks. tremendous. Okay. We're going to go now to the other woman in the glasses who was standing before. Just because I've uh, had this question for such a long time, and this is my only chance to ask it. So you said, what was the scene that really uh, encapsulated the wire? And as a writer, what had always occurred to me was the scene where Brother Muzon goes into the gay bar looking for Omar. And Rawls is sitting <laughs> at the bar. <laughs> <laughs> and I, what, okay. what did, <laughs> what it, what it did for me, first of all, I went, oh my God, that's why he's such a fucking asshole. <laughs> because he's in the closet. But the other thing was, <laughs> it made me feel like all of these characters had lives that I never got to see, but that you knew they were there, David Simon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess what I want to know is, how, when did you know that? But the, the, what? About, about <laughs> Rawls. Rawls is gay? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> when? I mean, um, we don't know that for sure. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely could have been he, there he, doing police work. He was, he was there, yeah, in an undercover capacity. Um, well, I, I can comment on that because <clears throat> nobody told me that that was going to happen. <clears throat> so I arrived on the set. <laughs> the AD came running over with this big shit-eating grin on his face <laughs> <laughs> and said, have you seen, have you read the new script? And I said, no. And Ed Burns was sitting there, and all of a sudden his head popped up. <laughs> and he grabbed me, he pulled me into a room on the side, and he said, this is what we're thinking about doing. Uh, you know, we may not do it, but uh, how do you feel about it? And I'm thinking to myself, it doesn't mean a goddamn thing what I think about it. <laughs> 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 So right. I said, yeah, well, yeah, okay, that sounds good. We, the answer, so, yeah. 
That is the fair answer. One, one episode more went by, and nothing was said. <laughs> Another episode went by, and nothing was said. And I'm thinking, what are they going to do with this? <clears throat> so I, I, I decided to really embrace it. I went up to David, called him aside. I said, David, I don't know what your plans are for this, you know, this gay thing, but I'm, op I'm open for anything. You can be <laughs> as courageous as you want. <clears throat> and David just looked at me like this. <laughs> <laughs> and walked away. <laughs> and in his brilliance, he never touched it again. He just planted the seed. <laughs> Yeah. All right, uh, much as I would love to take so many more questions, they're going to kick us out of the room. Thank all of you from the cast and producers for being here.